In August 1966, the Beatles played their last gig in San Francisco's Candlestick Park. And in the same month, they released a new album, which showed that they, too, were moving in a radically new direction. I don't know where you were when the first time you ever heard Tomorrow Never Knows. Somebody pulled us in off the street in 1967. In, in the hate, or was it was a 66, 66, I think. Pulled us right off the street into a record store and said, you've got to listen to this. You've got to listen to this. And that, it, it was Tomorrow Never Knows. So we felt very strongly at that time that the Beatles were on the same wavelength as we were. And in fact, it was everybody in San Francisco was and around the world, too. After years on the road, the Beatles had grown tired of screaming fans and now wanted to explore the possibilities of the studio. They too had been turned on to LSD and were experimenting with Eastern religion and music. John came with this idea, this song, which was uh, almost a chant. And he actually said that he wanted his, his voice to sound like the Dalai Lama on a, on a mountaintop. And it was a very insistent drum beat by, by Ringo, which was quite interesting. And Paul had been experimenting with tape recorders, and uh, he would bring me these weird loops made from guitars or, or just singing noises or uh, all sorts of things. And by having them on different machines, you have a loop on a machine, and then we fed that through, through the console, so that by raising any one of the faders at any one time, like an organ stop, the sound would come up. So the console, in the in the studio became a playing desk we have a special man who sits here and goes like this and the guitar turns into a piano or something you know and then you may say why don't you use a piano because the piano sounds like a guitar music from all over the world was thrown into the psychedelic melting pot George Harrison studied sitar with master musician Ravi Shankar, and the birds made their own synthesis. I first heard Ravi Shankar back in 1964 when Jim Dixon played some of the uh, stuff that they'd been recording over at World Pacific, where he worked, and Ravi was one of their artists, and uh, we loved it. It was I'd never heard anything like Indian music before, and Crosby and I got into it on the 12 strings. We started uh, playing... Uh, trying to emulate the sound of the sitar on the 12-string. I'm glad that I was almost 47 going 50, otherwise I might have lost my head, like many, most of them do, you know, with that adulation. It was just being treated like a rock star. I'm sure you must have been asked this lots of times before, but uh, uh, what's your opinion of um, sort of English pop groups and American pop groups using the sitar and the, and the uh, Indian influence in their records? Well, I'm afraid that uh, this, this sudden interest that there seems to be now might go away. What made me very angry that they all said that in India everyone takes drugs. Unless you take drugs, you cannot meditate, you cannot play music, you cannot have sex. And strange, which is completely wrong, you know. It's a beautiful morning. Nineteen sixty seven opened on a high note. In January, twenty thousand hippies crowded into Golden Gate Park for a taste of things to come. First thing in the morning, Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder and Lenore Kandel and other poets circumambulated the field in order to purify it using Tibetan mantras and chants. And uh, as the day went on, the stage was set up, uh, the bands came with their equipment, and people started to come in. The band 
we call the gathering of the tribes. When you walked into that park that day, man, it, it was so full of pot smoke, you could barely see. But there, it was totally crowded with people and camped out all over. It looked like this. It looked like a Chippewa village. The human being was a very interesting experience for me. I remember we got the word that was going to happen in Berkeley, and then in the morning uh, taking some LSD and going over to be in the audience and just experience it. And when I was uh, coming onto the LSD and sitting there, and I remember seeing everybody up on stage and thinking, uh, this is really great. This is like the, these are all the princes and princesses of the new tribe, and we're the tribes. I would say this to all the members of the establishment. We are happy and proud to have you in our brave new world. We realized at the time that we were communicating something to America. We were communicating that uh, thousands of American youth could gather together in peace and love, and that we were a force in the American political and social framework. The human being turned the Haight-Ashbury scene into national news, and the major record companies soon came calling. I took the president of Columbia Records to the Haight with his chief honchos. We were out here for the um, party presenting the debut of the Moby Grape album. And they walked him down Haight Street. And all he could see was dollar signs. And he was, wow, what's, hey, what? And I'd say, look, this is really happening. You have to understand what's going on here. This is your son. This is your daughter. And he said, son anybody you want. Son anybody you want. He's saying, get the, these people, tell them. You can son anybody you want. It was great, because he just saw the the cash register is going off right away. Warner Brothers sent their A&R man up to San Francisco to get the Grateful Dead out of the park and into the studio. We were nervous about them, so we thought maybe the best way to deal with the record company was to dose them. Then they'd know what we were all about, and they'd be our friends, and then we could trust them once they were high. So it, it became our objective to get Joe Smith and Warner Brothers people to San Francisco as many times as we could during these complex, complex negotiations. <laughs> and we'd hand them drinks, which they would not drink. The record companies were regarded in San Francisco uh, at that time as kind of robber barons who would just come in and plunder uh, the, whatever they could and uh, put it out, not pro probably not support it too much. and and just let it hang there and see what would happen. And uh, eventually, uh, the other bands were signing. And so uh, I think I personally th felt that we made our first record too soon, that we really weren't ready to record. We went to a jazz label. It was called Mainstream. It's actually a jazz phrase, meaning the conventional mainstream of music. And uh, they, they, when their needles would go in the red on the VU meters, they would just they would panic. And, and that's kind of where we, we wanted him to be in the red all the time, and they didn't want him to be in the red, so we were like pulling back and forth. 